Welcome to the McFeely Mess Podcast at Inforum.com. In-depth conversations and opinion covering a variety of topics from the world of news, sports, and more. Here's Mike McFeely. Welcome to another episode of the McFeely Mess Podcast, 25,000 foot edition as the Forum Company plane makes its way back from Johnson City, Tennessee to Fargo on Sunday morning, the morning after North Dakota State steals a 38-35 victory at East Tennessee State in a game that by all rights was over and done with, with about four minutes left, two minutes left, but the Bison found a way with Cam Miller scoring a touchdown with 50 seconds left on a scramble from 11 yards out to push the Bison to a victory and frankly save them from what would have been one of their worst losses, I think, in their Division I era. Joining me on the plane here is Jeff Kolpak, Stacy Anderson uh, from WDAY, the director of the broadcasts that you see on your television. I'll start with you, Jeff. Um, I'm Mr. Negative, so I'm seeing this as, oh my God, they escaped a victory or they escaped a loss rather that would have been a devastating to the program and the new head coach, where do you stand? Well, I think you're right. Steals, guilty as charged for sure. I mean, you know, this was improbable in a couple of ways. Um, one, just the way their defense just wasn't very good today or yesterday, just wasn't good. And two, to recover an onside kick, and I need to do the percentages, I gotta find that out, but it's not a high percentage play. And the fact that they successfully did that and scored just it makes it all the more, I could say, improbable. You've been following, you've been following this team for a long time, Stacy, all the way back to the Division Two days with Ed Schultz and all those guys, Jim Eilman. I, you were watching the game, you were you were working while doing so, but I mean, wh- where does this rank among the just the, the nutty comebacks, just the crazy endings to games? I've never seen a, a game that had the, the feel of a loss and the chance to come back and win it ever. This is probably the most amazing of the of the of the comebacks that, that you that I've ever seen. I think you know when you you put in perspective, you look at. I think a lot of people thought the Bison were going to come to Johnson City and beat just the, run over them, just right? beat them by yeah. 30 points, be done, take the win, go. And home I think get, they thought that too. I think they did too. Uh, I, I, the Buccaneers, I really thought, played about as good a defense as you're going to see. They were really solid tackling team. They, I felt like where the, all the Bison had all the the momentum up front. They had the strength and the size and the the ability. And 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 the Buccaneer defense really uh, uh, just neutralized that. I mean, it just and it felt like that right off the bat. The Bison come down, big drive, score. Okay, you know, and everybody's smiling. It's in the books. What is, you know, ETSU do, same thing. And they got some swagger on the side, and their, and their head coach, you know, he said it, we don't have to beat them 10 times, we just got to beat them once. You know, so, and, you know, and then the heels of Northern Illinois beating Notre Dame, I mean, it just felt like these guys were really believing it. You know, funny you brought up that historical perspective. I took the liberty in the FCS era of uh, putting a top 10 list of biggest rallies. And basically, I, my criteria, my criteria base were, you know, what was most improbable or in, in, in the moment or in the, in, in, in the result of that. So I will go in descending order and feel free to pipe in whenever you want. Number 10, Steve Walker at UC Davis, down 24 nothing. And I, I, I don't have the years in front of me because I can't, I don't have my laptop. That must, I think that might have been 2006, Four, maybe 2005, five, yeah. somewhere in there. But they, but, but they were, in that we, we can hash over the, yeah. each game. We have time. We're, yeah. we're, 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 we're just floating above the earth right now. We have nothing else to do. Um, that they, I think they were down twenty-four nothing at halftime. Yes, yes. Weren't they? I mean, they were absolutely dead. I mean, you're just going, oh my God, they're getting boat raced. This is going to be embarrassing. And then I think they shut Davis out in the second they half did, and, and came and, back and, and he had won. like a big fourth and twenty pass to John Majeski or something oh God. in the end zone and just. Uh, had uh, just that's the beginning of the Steve Walker magic, and and he's part of this list in more than one. And so I'll go to number nine. Number nine, Steve Walker versus Sam Houston in 2007. That's when Sam Houston went up late in the game, 
the fans were hitting the exits, man, at the dome. And it's like, oh, this game's over. Uh, it was kind of a short kickoff. Walker had some short pass to somebody. And I think it was like 45 yards. Um, like, I don't know how many seconds, 30 seconds. He hits Cole Heckendorf in the front corner of the end zone on a play they drew up in the huddle. They literally drew it up in the huddle. I, I, I think there was... I think there was a play before that that got him some yards, though. There was yeah. like a was it was it a hook was it a hook and ladder? Did they run a hook and ladder like before that, and then Walker hit Heckendorf for the touchdown? But that was that that game was sort of back and forth the whole time. Like Red forty-one thirty-eight. Bo- Red yeah. Bomar was the quarterback for I was going to say Oklahoma. He was at one point for Sam Houston, and so people were. It never felt like NDSU was just dead like the I mean they you kind of you didn't know they're going to come back in the last 30 seconds but you never went oh this one's over last night you felt like with five minutes left this this is just over it's just done okay and this is how many rallies there are I put this Miller thing at number eight just because recovering an onside kick is hard to do and the setting and all that and they look cooked so we'll just, we already talked about that so I put this uh the bison game at number eight number seven Steve Walker again at Ball State, 2006, the first FBS win. They were down. Uh, I think Pat Perlis dies up, dials up a wide receiver screen to Travis White. He takes it to the house, and they win 29-24. You know that was one of those plays too, where it felt like, like you said, it was almost over, and they had to find some type of magic. I, Steve Walker to me was one of those guys who kind of cemented that bison lore of comebacks because he was he was one of the guys who kept dialing it up. I can go back to Davis. I know you had it earlier. To me, that was the one where the guy just to dot everything. It was, uh, I was a big Steve Walker guy. You talked to Craig Bull during that time, and he would, tell, he would tell you that Steve Walker was not a good practice player. And he goes, <laughs> Monday through Thursday or Friday, the guy is just okay. And then, but man, on game day, he just showed up every time. All he did was just made big plays and found and found big receivers and a bunch of them. You know, he he had he had favorites like everybody, but he would always find somebody to help him win the game. Yep. Okay. Number six, uh, Carson Wentz versus South Dakota State, the playoff game. I can't remember what a year is. 27-24. The pass to Erzendowski in the back corner of the end zone. That was a the, good one. That, that was a big play. That, that was that was to me one of the most amazing passes that that was an nfl pass is what that was that would have had to be 2014 i think so because that was erzendowski's true freshman year yep so that was 2014 at the fargo dome uh yeah i mean that was and that drive that wentz led they were the bison were done a couple of times on that drive because i think they converted at least one fourth down and then got a, a pass interference penalty on fourth down that helped down by the goal line that put him in position that was south dakota state was finally going to beat ndsu and they were going to end the the dynasty before it really ever got started although they'd already won three but that was wentz magic there that was an incredible throw and incredible catch by erzendowski in the end zone okay we're down with walker he's done <laughs> number five brock chanson versus georgia southern fcs semifinals 2012. it's fourth and one at the three I believe there's there's two timeouts, and in the story that came out after the game, Brett Vegan is up in the coach's box as old coordinator, and they're discussing what play. And Vegan goes, "Give it to Jensen," and he's almost defiant, like for the two three minutes of those two timeouts, and he just held his ground. So we got to give it to Jensen, and he did his old reverse pivot, quarterback run up the middle, and the Bison went on to Frisco. The loud, in the loudest game probably yeah, that I it was can remember. Loud, yeah. It was tremendous. That was a crowd manufactured uh, a win as well. I think that was, I can't remember the score, but uh, it, yep, they stop them, game's over. And Georgia Southern's yep. running out of the tunnel into the and, and Georgia Southern still had a chance after that, by the way. Oh, is that the field goal that was? That, that yeah. was where they missed the long field goal. Yeah. Because the year before, NDSU just pounded them like 35-7. to 7. But they had Jarek McKinnon playing quarterback. And I think they made a couple of big passes to get within, quote-unquote, field goal range. Georgia Southern didn't have a kicker. And so they ran some poor kid out there to try a 50-yard field goal. And it, 
he was partially dipped or something at the line of scrimmage. Okay, I was mistaken. Number four, Steve Walker. <laughs> He's going to be sponsoring this podcast before this is over. At Cal Poly, 2007, the Bison are 9-0, and undefeated, going into the Great West game, and Cal Poly was just killing them. I can't remember the score, but... Um, the Bison found themselves at their own four-yard line with under a minute left. At no timeouts. So Walker scrambles for 16 yards to the 20. Then he kills the clock with a spike. At second and 10, goes back, lofts a bomb down the right sideline to Heckendorf, takes it to the house. 80-yard TD to win it. But for some reason, I don't know why Polly just felt like they weren't prepared for Ellerson, that. Rich Ellerson... Was he, he was in man he was in man, man, man press coverage. Right. And after the game he goes, They should fire me. I'm going, Yeah. <laughs> well, made, I mean, it was a night game. I had to redo my whole story. Yep. <laughs> well and that's what I mean. Yet yet man to man with Heckendorf on the outside. Yeah. It was like it just wasn't fair. I, I think everybody in the press box and they looked at each other like, What are they doing? Yeah. Well, I had the story written essentially saying the dream of the unbeaten season in 07. Remember, they were still going for, I think they're trying to lobby for a bowl game because yeah, they're ineligible right. for the playoffs. That's right. And so it, it kept that alive. And it, it just. Wanted to change the rules to try to get an FCS team right, yeah, yep, right into a bowl game. Yep. So that was number four. Number three, oh, Cam Peterson, your Easton stick at Iowa, which stick uh, orchestrated that second half rally. Uh, they scored, missed a two-point conversion, were down one, get the ball back, the stick leads them down, gets them in range of Cam Peterson's 39-yard field goal, which at the horn goes through and craziness erupts and so at much, Kinnick. And so much because it's Iowa, it's the Big Ten, it's Big TV. It's they, were, they were nationally ranked. Correct, they were, yeah. I, you know, the, that was, uh, to me, one of the two biggest wins I think the program's had. Uh, you know, obviously, you always probably put more emphasis on FBS schools than you do FCS schools, but that was a huge one. Number two, Brock Jensen versus Kansas State. Obviously, 2013 wow. season opener. Kansas State's the returning Big 12 champions. 80 yards, 18 plays for the game-winning drive. Again, and Jensen, I, what, he had three of those, a reverse pivot sort of option run and just cuts it up and scores. And think about how many third downs they converted on that a drive, lot. too. You know, and, and it was, nothing was really negative. They would lose maybe two, then they'd gain eight. You know, and that was one of those games. I'm surprised that's not your number one. Well, I'll tell you the reason why I'm number one. But Derek Lang was big on that drive. Zach Fra was big on that drive. Like Ryan Smith had a first down. And, you know, and, and like you said, Kansas State at the time was, they were the defending Big 12 champs. I, I, to be proved fraudulently later, but it was still a night game. Bill, was it a Bill Snyder honoring Bill Snyder night or something? It was a huge crowd. I mean, it was, and I think the iconic part of that is when that buys an offensive line, when they would take shots, you'd see the uh, Kansas State defenders, hands on hips, hands over their heads, you know, just trying it to It was a Jim Kramer moment. It was salt. No, no they doubt. They gave them salt. That was the difference. <laughs> Number one, any guesses? I'm going to say uh, Illinois State yep. game in Frisco, Texas. Yeah, I, I, I put that number one simply because it was for a the national F championship. FCS national title. Illinois State uh, scores to go up 27-23. Trey Roberson broke a long run yep. to go up 27-23. Looked like the game was over. Which, by the way, Kyle Manuel did not miss the fit, <laughs> he's adamantly <laughs> says. NDSU gets the ball at the 20. They have a false start penalty, so they're back to the 15. A long pass to Erzendowski around midfield. Then I think there was another short pass to the right side. And then Illinois State does a zero blitz. They throw everybody. Wentz just heaves it up. Erzendowski cuts in front of the D-back, hauls it in at the four, and then Wentz takes it the next play. True freshman, Erzendowski. Yeah. That's, that's the same year that they beat uh, South Coast State. State in the playoffs. Yeah, I mean, there's no doubt. Um, they're, they're, and we'll get to this a little bit later here, but only a couple of those games felt like NDSU was was totally. That's a good done. point. That's a good point. And, and they were and they were mostly against really good teams. Maybe East Tennessee State is going to surprise me, but this one just felt like, oh my God, this is going to be a 
this is a loss that Tim Palsek is going to this is going to take a while to shake this one off because this is a, a Southern Conference team that was picked sixth in the Southern Conference. It's not Illinois State for a championship. It's not South Dakota State. It's not you know Cal Poly or Sam Houston even. It's East Tennessee State, and that's the one where I just, that's where I was last night going. Oh my God, this is well. Th th he is going to Palsek and the Bison program are going to get roasted, deservedly so, for losing this game where they were favored by 27 in this game. Let's get to this game. Uh, well, I'm going to yeah. I'm going I'm to throw one more game at you for that. Oh yeah, player. sure. Yeah. Northern Iowa, 2015, yeah. at the Fargo Dome in the playoffs. Uh, Aaron Bailey bust an 80-yard touchdown run to go up in the final couple minutes, maybe the final minute, and then Carson Wentz takes the Bison on a drive, hits Darius Shepard in the back of the end zone with an iconic Scott Miller call. Uh, does he have it? He does! Touchdown, Bison! My, oh, my! And it was the, the, talk about Georgia Southern loud. That was Northern Iowa loud. That place was nuts when Wentz hit Darius Shepard in the end zone for that touchdown. Scotty had a great call on the 80 yard to Heckendorf yep. at Cal Poly when he goes and he goes back to pass and he hits Heckendorf. Are you kidding me? Are you kidding me? <laughs> yep, yep, yep. That was great. So, that, so that's one more. That makes uh, well, the Bozeman block last year. You got to maybe throw that somewhere. That, that was sort of a rally. Yeah, that was, but that was overtime. They, yeah. they tied it up. How about the James Madison interception? The James Madison interception. Uh, to, what was that? The quarterfinals or semifinals by. Uh, in the end zone, oh. the uh, one-handed interception by Destin Talbert. Destin Talbert. Yeah. But, that, but again, that, that's not like a, a last-second yeah. rally. Yeah. That was that, that was a, that, that was a game-saving interception. Okay, so here's what Jeff and I were talking about last night a little bit as we were in his room drinking Mountain Dew, watching Cal at San Diego State play. Um, and, and I don't know quite how I feel about this, but so. So my column basically from last night's game was what I've been talking about today, which is, oh my gosh, NDSU escaped an embarrassing loss, a devastating loss. They didn't play well, but they found a way to win, et cetera, et cetera. That game last night was one of the most incredible comebacks you will ever see. I mean, that was an all-timer. That was, I mean, if you, if you look at it objectively, as from the viewpoint of somebody who doesn't know, you know, what should have happened, that was an incredible comeback. They, they were dead. The Bison were done. As, as Trey Lamb said, stick a fork in them because they were Trey done. Trey Lamb. Trey Lamb, yeah. What did I say, Lance? Yeah, yeah. yeah sorry. <laughs> Trey Lamb, yeah. the head coach of East Tennessee State, said, stick a fork in them. We had them beat. They were done. It was, I mean, you look at everything that had to happen for the Bison to win that game, and everything happened. And yet, myself, and more so from the emails and text messages I'm getting from the fan base, they're like going, well, that sucked. It should have never been that close. And so I, I know that, that being NDSU brings some of that baggage with it. They should kill everybody by 40 points. But at the, I don't know that we're appreciating, or at least I, I don't know if I'm appreciating that that was a once-in-a-lifetime comeback. Just, just the circumstances around it. I don't know I'll ever see that again. So think about this. At a, so Kyle Emanuel, Emanuel and I talked a lot about this. And there were so many big plays in that game. And I know there are in every game. But if any one of these things don't happen, the Bison lose that game. The really bad kickoff where Trey Lamb just completely met his kicker at the numbers and eyeballed him and you and, and talk to him all the way back and by talking that's a polite way of seeing he chewed his keister all the way back the muffed punt that was recovered the onside kick that was recovered the johnny gores being johnny on the spot when fourth and the, ten the ball's not even supposed to go to him and the and uh you know uh, miller's hit and the ball doesn't flutter but it doesn't go where it's supposed to go and he and he, and he turns it into a you know he, almost one of the officials you know gave him the touchdown on it if any of those things don't happen, you know, the uh, mix-up at the goal line where, you know, Cam Miller's trying to hand it out to somebody. And then they have a holding penalty. It. Yeah. I mean, and, and don't even talk about the penalties. I mean, you know, Polisek, uh, Coach Polisek said it when he goes, Monday's not going to be pleasant for his team. I mean, I get that. You know, they it, it shouldn't be. 
But if, if any of those things don't happen in that game, the buys and lows, but they did. And that would, like you said, I mean, how they hold that out of the fire, it will be, again, that's why people hate the Notre Dames of the world. That's why people hate those teams that they just find a way to come back and win because they didn't quit, you know, and they just said, all right, well, we got time and we got the ball still. The clock isn't at zero. Yeah, let's keep going. But I think, again, and, and that was a good point, Mike, on that was, that was something. East Tennessee won 58 of those 60 minutes. But yep. the last two is what is, 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 is yeah. what counted. Yeah, yeah, they did. But let's look at objectively now. Let's look at this team objectively. Defensively, things do we do things got to change or I mean, do you t do you overreact too much after one game? They, they the, rushed they, for 270 yards. Th that was the most rushing yards since South Dakota State, I think, in the spring season. And the NDSU just doesn't get run on to that extent. They they'll lose games, and South Dakota State has had little problems moving the ball in the last few years. North Dakota last year just dominated them up in Grand Forks. But we, we have said from the beginning, and maybe we were drinking the Kool-Aid after watching the Colorado game and the Tennessee State game, which should not have made us drink the Kool-Aid, but the Bison safeties and linebackers ha have not been necessarily good against Colorado and against East Tennessee State. I mean, those, middle, line, middle linebackers those, had four tackles. Those, 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 those same flaws showed up yesterday, and East Tennessee State found a way to exploit them. And, and, and credit to Trey Lamb. I mean, and his staff and his players, they found that they, they saw things that they liked on film, which everybody else is going to see, and they had the skilled players to, to, to run the ball. But the Bison have issues at linebacker and at safety and I linebacker maybe there's some younger options that the Bison could try if you want to go to a true freshman or or some younger guys but it's safety um you know we've seen Darius Givens a couple times now take really bad angles you know uh Sam Young is what he is you know, Ryan Jones is what he is. I think Jalen Crumby at safety when he comes back from this thumb injury is going to get every shot in the world. I do. Yeah, I mean, yeah. maybe. I, I don't know. I'm, but but there's defensively they have issues at certain positions, and that's going to be an issue because, again, East Tennessee State is not a Missouri Valley Conference team. I mean, if they ran for 270, North Dakota can really run the ball up in Grand Forks. They're better than we all expected. And they can run the ball. They didn't yesterday because <laughs> because teams are stacking the box against them now. But you know they're big enough and good enough to move. What's South Dakota State going to do with a quarterback like Gronowski who can throw well, and they do are able to run the ball? Southern Illinois, all, all the teams in the valley know NDSU inside and out. This was East Tennessee's first shot, and so there, there's some things to look ahead at. That I mean, hooray for the victory. You got to win the games that, that are in front of you, but but what's ahead now for NDSU? East Tennessee scored 35 points. Jalen King, the quarterback, six of 15, 113 yards. He missed an open guy that would have been a touchdown. He threw it out of bounds. Remember the long pass down the right sideline. He was not a good throwing quarterback. No, and he had a receiver that made a great play for him that should have been intercepted or you know should have been knocked down. Yeah. He, I think it was a pi on the and about the goal line. I, you know. I think for East Tennessee State, and I, I think part of it, I, they definitely, you know, you, you always hear the cliche, gave them their best shot. I think if you put East Tennessee State in the Missouri Valley, they're not a 500 team because I don't think you can get that emotional about one game and bring it in because this week you got number two NDSU. Next, in two weeks, you got number one SDSU. You know, you got four top ten teams on your schedule. You know, that just doesn't happen. I know they got Mercer and all that, you know, Go Bears. But the, the point being, <laughs> you're welcome. But the point being, I think, the, to Mike's point, the same thing that have happened the last few years are they don't tackle as well as they probably should defensively. I was surprised, and I said it earlier, that – Physically, they match the Bison, and that that that's the thing that shocked me. I always, I'm always a big Kool-Aid drinker that the Bison offensive line there, they can get things done. They, 
they did and then they didn't and then they, when they didn't it looked bad because they had holdings they, they they're making young offensive line mistakes here in game three i think marty brown's your 15 to 20 carry back well uh, let's stay on, on this topic okay. just for just for one second is if and i'm going to be the glass half full guy because i just poured some sprite into my glass to make it half full Th this was East Tennessee State's Super Bowl, Stanley Cup, World Series, game seven. Final Four, Game 7, all rolled into one. And clearly, Trey Lamb has been looking at this game longer than just the last five days. I mean, right? I mean, it, it, you know, I'm sure he was looking at film over the summer. I'm sure that he was game planning what he was going to do. July 4th, on, he's right, game yeah, planning. I mean, yes, I mean, so, so let's... Maybe we have to pump the brakes a little bit that the Valley teams are not, the Valley teams know the Bison and they have better probably size and, and you know, but the, the Valley teams are in the grind week to week where they, you can't look ahead in the Valley you're going to lose unless it's the usual suspects. But I mean, Trey Lamb had these guys ready to go. And again, more power to him. It was a well coached, he out coached, I thought, Paul Sec in this game. And so, when we get to the grind, we'll see how things go. But just just to pump the brakes a little bit, th this was the biggest football game of Trey Lamb's career. It was the biggest football game that East Tennessee State has had for since the since a playoff game against Georgia Southern. They won 1960. Yeah, and they, they, they had a weird like playoff. 1999. They, they had a weird something. playoff game a couple of years ago against Kennesaw State, but that's was a weird playoff game against Kennesaw State. This this was a huge, huge, huge deal for East Tennessee State to play this game. And so that I think that a little bit has to be factored in as well. I think, you know, you're talking about Trey Lamb. I think that he looked at this game more for on a my just my take and listening to him talk at his press conferences, he really marketed this game as this was a career game for him. If I can beat NDSU, you know, I'm going to go places. Oh, and by the way, this is a program building game, too. You know, I, it certainly felt like uh, he put a lot of emphasis on this. And I think after the game, we had a fantastic shot of him where he's off in the side. And there's a state trooper who's trying to console him. He's got his hands on both knees. He looks like he's going to throw up. Yeah, I mean, he, he when you're that close, you're that close to kissing the prettiest girl at the party. And you just then it slips away from you. I mean, I get it. It's, it was a uh, kick in the gut to the guy. So it's going to be an interesting week, homecoming week, and Tim's comment after the game to us was uh, the tone needs to be set on Monday for homecoming week. And what do you think that means? Well, I mean, you know, the, the thing that we believed was happening under Matt Entz a couple of times was, you know, like the Southern Illinois game in the, in the spring season. You know, throughout the fact that it was the weird spring season, all that stuff, the players after the game were saying, we thought we could just roll our helmets out there and beat every team. And I think, like the UND game last year, they, they just didn't look ready to play. They just like, they, they, and, and, and this game, it kind of had that vibe that they... Cap Miller said that after the game. He I, alluded to it a little bit when he said, I thought some players took it a little loose. Yeah, the and game. so I, I thought NDC was kind of over that with Tim Palsek. I thought that he was really, you know, that's not going to happen. We're going to be into every game, yada, yada, yada. And I, the, the offense the, the offense was fine. I, I know that you, Stacy, had, you know, kind of thought things physically didn't go well. I I just thought NDC kind of got away from who they were, which is another thing we've talked about for years is, I mean, the, the offensive line was dominating the first half, and then all of a sudden they decided to start throwing the ball more and, and doing so. I didn't, I didn't get the change of philosophy, but it just kind of felt like NSU maybe wasn't fully ready to go. And after they scored that first touchdown on an easy drive down the field, it's just like, kind of oh, like, this, ah, is, right, this, yeah. this is over. And, and I thought we were kind of over that under Tim Palasek, but, but maybe the Bison aren't over that. Well, I guess... Um, I, I just think this is a big week. It's it's Towson. Should be a winnable game. And if there are going to be any changes, now is when you do it. Okay, you're not going to wait till the eighth or ninth game through Valley play. If you have the trust in your players and some younger players, if you do want to make changes, 
now would be the time to do it. And this is your, this is your, Towson got beat by Villanova by one point, or they lost by one two point. two field goals. Yeah, you know, so, I mean, I, I don't, I, you know, that's one of those, we'll see where that rests too. I, if I'm NDSU, to me, this is a, a game that, again, NDSU on paper should be Towson. I don't think they're screaming, you know, they're going to be the, you know, world beaters here. But I also think that with uh, NDSU, I, I would hate to have Southern Illinois the next game up, or UND, or or USD. I mean, some one of the one of the legitimate heavyweights, because uh, you know they, there's a lot of things to learn from this tape. I think, um, uh, but you know, and every coach says, you know, it's a bottom line. You know, well, we have some injuries. Yep, everybody does. Well, you know, we get everybody shot. Well, everybody does. You know, I mean, it's you, you, after a while, you just gotta. The 2019 buys that aren't walking through that tunnel next week, you know, it's this is the team you got, these are the players you got, and they got to they're gonna find a way to, to make things better. Stace, you gotta get me out of the control board and back on the mic. <laughs> we don't who's Dom Izzo? <laughs> Dom who? You've been holding me back for years. Yeah. If you had the suit on that Kyle Emanuel had on yesterday, <laughs> you you are built for TV. <laughs> Only former NFL guys can pull off those kinds of suits. <laughs> I used to be fun at the thrift store in Johnson City to be referring to a USD game last year. Popping tags in a thrift store. I Well, it's been about 30 minutes. We could talk about this for the rest of the plane flight, but we've I think we've covered what we need to cover. There'll be plenty of talk about what's wrong with NDSU, what's right with NDSU um, th- for the next five days before Towson. I, it's still the second-ranked team in the country, even though it's clearly not the 20. 20- 21 team or the 2019 team in what is le- I mean South Dakota State yesterday struggled with Augustana South Dakota State beat Augustana 24 Georgia won by one point Georgia won by one point over Kentucky yesterday so these things happen South Dakota State I think is still the favorite by a fair margin in FCS Mark Gronowski threw two interceptions that were not good interceptions against Augustana yesterday Hell, that my Dragons were at state. Won at Minnesota Duluth yesterday for the first time since 1999. So these things happen. I think you should sing the Moritz State school song. Go Dragons, fight for thee. <laughs> okay, maybe not, maybe not, maybe not. <laughs> so so I, there's going to be a lot of chatter this week about what's wrong with the Bison. There's still plenty right with them. Cam, Cam Miller is damn good. Cam Miller's the heart and soul of this team. He, he put it, I mean, he, Steve Walker did last night. He did. Yep. He, he eased and sticked it last night, and he is still underappreciated for what he does. He's good. He's an NFL quarterback. He's carrying this team offensively on his back, and we have to appreciate that, appreciate that at some point. It could be worse. They, they could not have a quarterback. They could be Northern Iowa right now. They could be Montana right now. A good place to start is having a really good quarterback. You know, and that's exactly right. I think the thing about Cam Miller, twice they've tried to unseat him. Here's a guy who's won a national title, played in another. Twice they've tried to bring in quarterbacks to unseat Cam Miller. And all he does is he had the comeback win against, was it Missouri State? You know, he came in for Quincy. You know, the kid's a winner. I, I'm, a, I'm a Cam Miller fan. I think he's, a, like you said, there. There's, and you're right. It seems like when the Bison don't play well, or, or if they lose, or if they, or if they, if it's a tight game, there's more to talk about because you know, oh my gosh, because the expectation is to the mountaintop. You you expect them just to dominate teams, and sometimes those things happen. You're right, and they're still a good team. They're gonna be playing in December. There's a, to me, there's no doubt about that. Just if it's gonna be home or away, you know, and that's that's why these kind of games are so. Particularly, yeah, this game or, could make a difference right. in selection time. You know, that's and that's what I mean. You know, so that that's why you need to have these games. It would be it'd be better to win this game by 30 than than by you know by the skin of your teeth. But point being, they still won the game, and that's the bottom line. We'll wrap it up. Thank you guys. This All has right. been the McFeely Mess Podcast, 25,000 foot edition. Listeners love it, man. I mean, the the, well, do, the download numbers for 25,000 feet edition are comparatively huge compared to me talking to Jim Shaw about politics. I don't know why that would be because that's very exciting to talk about Donald Trump and eating cats and eating dogs. 
but uh, the 25,000 feet podcast do very well. Jeff Kolpak, thank you. Stacey Anderson, thank you. This has been the McFeely Mess Podcast at Inforum.com. Thanks for listening to the McFeely Mess Podcast at Inforum.com. For more podcasts and columns, head to Inforum.com and search Mike McFeely.